Thank you. That's what I hate. Prof, welcome. Thank you for being here today. So I think um, the best way to start this would be to ask the most obvious question. And that would be, can you please give us a brief definition of tradi African traditional medicine? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks, I think, to the people who are here to come and listen to me. Um, how do we define traditional medicine? It's, it's really a knowledge system. It's a health knowledge system based on, I think, the practices. It's based on the skills, the health skills. And these, I think, knowledge systems, you know, are derived from the beliefs. They are derived, I think, from, I think, the knowledge and the practices uh, of indigenous societies and communities. And these knowledge systems, and uh, particularly health, they are there to maintain well-being, they are there to restore health, they are there to treat, and they are normally based on medicinal plants or traditional medicinal plants. They are based on animal I think, you know, uh, products, they are based on minerals, but as well as based on music, dances and the speech. And all these are there to restore well-being, they are there to restore health, to treat and mitigate against diseases. That's how we define traditional medicine. It's a science of its own. And that is indeed such a beautiful definition. Um, I'm taken away <laughs> by that alone. Um, Paul, I just wanted to ask, where did your, your love for this, uh, or your interest rather, when did your interest for this um, particular field um, of discipline begin? I, I want to say, I think, you know, every African child, um, or every child who has been born from a third world country, one way or the other in their lives, they would have gone through traditional healing, traditional medicine, traditional practices. I've gone through that system as well. But my curiosity, I think, as a scientist has been, do these things in fact work? You know, is there, is there a value for them, you know, um, that we continue seeing that? And it was, I think, of late that one begins to realize that, in fact, health systems, the medicines that we use, have their roots and origins from a knowledge system, from a traditional knowledge system. So medicine did not just crop out of nowhere. It cropped out of that definition of experiences, of practices, of the theories, and the knowledge. That's how medicine started. So the science of medicine, it's not a science that started, I think, at a medical school, or it started in the lab, but it started from the community beliefs systems. Now that we know that, we, we then we begin to realize, as I sit here with you today, that almost you know, a, a quarter of all our prescription medicines. If you were to walk out here, you go to any hospital, you go to any pharmacy, you will find that, in fact, most of the mainstay drugs that we have today are derived from natural products. Let's give you a simple example. Uh, we talk about aspirin. You know, when you send your child to go and buy your aspirin, you know, you never think that aspirin comes from a tree. Those that have asthma, you use salbutamol, that little pump. 
The active thing in that salbutamol is a molecule called theophylline. It comes from the theobroma tree. All cancer medicines, 90% of them, in Christine, in Blastin, you know, they all are derived from plants. So medicines that are plant-based or natural medicines, they treat 90% of all currently known human diseases. Those are facts. Okay? Those people that go to have transplants, whether you go and have your kidney transplant, whether you go and have your heart transplant, they give you two types of drugs. These are immune suppressant. Uh, they give you cyclosporin, they give you FK506 to dampen up your immune system so that you don't have the rejection. You know, if I give you a, a heart or a kidney from someone, your body recognizes it as a foreign you know, thing, so it would reject it, it would go send white cells, attack it, kill it. But for us to stop that, those two drugs, cyclosporin and K506, they are natural based drugs, they come from traditional medicines. And these are still used today. People who have type 2 diabetes, as we speak now, they use metformin. Metformin comes from a plant. So that's why we say many of the natural derived drugs have been the mainstay, you know, of the current drugs. They've actually surpassed and succeeded the current multi-drug resistant changes. Okay? Penicillin, we know where the origins of penicillin is. Um, we talk about cocaine, we talk about morphine that's used for pain. So if your panados fail, if your aspirins fail, you know, for serious pains, then we get given, I think, your morphins. These are all plant-based. So the list goes on and on and on and on. We talk about chloroquine, quinine. You know, quinine has been used for you know, heart problems, atrial inflammation, where your heart seems to have lost a rhythm of pumping properly. Then you get even quinine. Quinine's derivation comes from infected Aztec people in uh, Brazil. They've been using that. And we copy the use of that bank. And we still use screening today. So we can sit here and give you all beautiful stories that the best traditional medicines that we have today are actually traditional medicines still up. But I also want to ask you, Prof, do you think that there's, there's an agenda? Um, and the reason why I ask that is because, as we know, there are different kinds of medicine, like you mentioned. However, traditional medicine has been the most dominant medical system for millions of people before a certain era. Uh, there are people who see it as primitive, unfortunately, as opposed to modern medicine. What then is its role and importance in this era that we live in? Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I think it's all about being informed and getting, getting the, right, the right knowledge. Now, where has this demonization of traditional medicines, you know, uh, come from? I think around the 1600s, um, when there was this advent of organic chemistry, uh, everybody felt that uh, because now we can uh, identify the molecules, uh, we can go and synthesize these molecules in the laboratories. So we cannot go back to the woods, we cannot go back to the bush. But in fact, very quickly we realized that we have come to a cul-de-sac. Now, here's a problem. You cannot make a molecule in the laboratory if you do not know the cause of the disease. You know, how, how, how do you start off making a molecule? Now, the second challenge is that even if we then can make a molecule 
based on what we know. Drug resistance and multi-drug resistance has now taught us that the molecule that we are going to be making, very soon it's going to be a failure. Because we are making it based on a scaffold of what is already failing. But plants, natural resources, they have then taught us that you can actually have a different scaffold. Uh, and those scaffolds are unique. Um, people who do organic chemistry, they are always told that there are five rules to make molecules that can then be developed into, into drugs. Now, sorry, boys, when I talk about drugs, in, in the lab when we talk about drugs, we don't talk about drugs in the context that you know. We talk about drugs as medicines that you make in the lab. So when I say drugs, I'm not talking about Nyaope and all these funny things. <coughs> so in chemistry, then we say there are these five rules. They call them the Pinky's rule. But in fact, the Pinky's rule fails a lot when it comes to making new molecules. Like for instance, if you look at how AZT very recently was, was developed. It was actually developed from a natural product, those that do not know. AZT's origin is from a traditional natural product, it's from a crayon. Then isolated it and worked it out. When we had the H1N1, you know, um, the swine flus and all these funny things, there was a spice in China uh, called the star anise. From that spice, then we derived what we call Tamiflu. And that's a drug that's now being sold and marketed by Roche. And that's a drug that would read off, I think, you know, the swine flu. And why I'm saying this is simply because they do not obey the Lipinski's rule of how to manufacture and make drugs, you know, from organic synthesis. So the best route is still going through what nature gives you. Because nature gives you something that works. A lot of us have the little periwinkle flower. They come in white or purple flowers. People grow them at home. But actually you do not know that in fact those two flowers, those are the ones where Eli Lilly has developed been Christine and been blasting for leukemia. So we go and buy these things while in fact you have grown these little things in your garden and you do not know that, in fact, they are, in fact, the foundation of your current drugs. So, it was around the 1600s when people felt that traditional medicine is bad. But the second and the biggest problem was the issue about the market shares. Okay? It was more about greed from the pharmaceutical industries. Do pharmaceutical industries really want to treat disease or do they just want to maintain the disease? So it was around those issues to say, this is bad, this is evil, this is witchcraft, forget about it. Hence why I think countries like our South Africa had the Witchcraft Suppression Act to actually say to people, your culture, your knowledge, your belief, your practice is bad. It was said for humankind. But I think right now we're beginning to learn and know that many of the solutions, I just said that 90% of all known human diseases are treated by medicines that are derived from natural products and traditional medicines. 
Hence why we want to say, let's go back to our roots to find these innovative health solutions. Because I think this spot has no end. It's unlike a cul-de-sac in organic chemistry. You can't just go and say, I'm going to the ledge and make up something. You go into the lab and make up something based on something else. But our medicines, our traditional medicines, the approach, whether you use it singularly or whether you use it in combination, you may probably not get the resistance that we're talking about today. It's actually very interesting what you mentioned there that, you know, we, we have these plants in our homes, but we don't know their uses. Um, and you go out and you buy it. It just goes to show how misinformed we really are as a society. I think that was a year ago. Um, we talk about epilepsy. Um, Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town, I say I'm in Cape Town in also. He came to me and said, you know what, um, we've been using phenytoin, we've been using carbamazepine, we've been using all these things to the children. But it's not reducing the number of feats of these children. Uh, what can we do in terms of traditional medicines? Now, I'm bringing this because I think I'm also sitting into the International League Against Epilepsy. Uh, Australia, I think, you know, Greenland, America, all these experts. You know, the movement now is now to look at plant-based therapies for epilepsy, including the use of cannabis and cannabinoids. Prof, uh, I just want to say thank you so, so much.